Hey everybody, John Grimsmo here, and in this video, we're talking about this thing. I have had this machine for five and a half years. It is now completely paid off. We did a five-year lease with a $1 buyout at the end. And uh, yeah, I wanna tell you guys about the whole process. So it all started back in 2015. We had, I mean, Eric and I were in my garage, in my house. He was living in my basement at the time. Um, we had the Tormac CNC mill and the Tormac lathe in, in the garage, and the garage was getting smaller. It was a 20 foot by 20 foot garage, 400 square feet. This whole shelf used to be full of my aluminum anodizing equipment. Here is dirty and used and put away wet, and uh, I love this machine. And I'm not just saying that, I love this machine. What are you doing? Looks fancy. Becoming fingerprints and stuff. Oh no. Hoping it's not doing the same thing that I just fixed. The tame thing. And uh, it was packed, and we wanted a bigger machine. We were actually really looking into a Haas mini mill uh, or a super mini mill because it could fit in that garage, and that was the the extent of my um, my dreams at the time. It was like I don't want to get a big shop, but uh, we start as we got deeper into that process, we realized. For one, the floors um, in that garage were not going to handle much more weight and et cetera, et cetera. We wanted to grow the business a little bit more. So it was, it was not just buying a machine, but a shop had to come with it. We needed a place to put it. So we were looking at bigger machines, definitely looked at the Brother Speedio. I still love that machine. A lot of people, I know a lot of people that have it that are very, 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 very happy with it. Um, but. I was looking, I was looking at all the brands, I'd go to all the tool shows around Toronto and IMTS in Chicago and try to figure out what, what to spend our money on basically, or our borrowed money, the bank's money. Um, and then if the bank would even give us a loan to be able to do it. But in the end, uh, DMG Mori came through, this was a showroom model, so it had like some hours on it from going to various shows. Um, so I got a substantial discount on this machine um, because it had some hours on it. And I was like, oh, that's good. So I can get that for the same price as that machine or cheaper and it's better and it's an awesomer machine. Um, so that's kind of how I found this one. Our DMG Mori guy like offered it to us and we looked at it and we thought of it and I'm like, that's huge. That's not going to fit in the garage. <laughs> so we actually committed to buying the machine before we had a place to put it. And then we looked hard, 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 hard to find the shop that we spent the last five years in. Not this building, but the shop just before this. Um, so when we had, when the machine was finally delivered and the shop was empty, it was like, it was weird because you had this big, beautiful machine in a totally empty shop. Um, but yeah, Eric and I sat down and we, we figured out that this, this was probably going to be the right choice for us. And now five years later, I'll, throughout the video, I'll kind of explain uh, that it has been a very good decision. So one of the big reasons for getting a big machine was to increase our production, obviously. Um, we developed the Rask, we designed it around February 2015, uh, thinking that it would be easier to make. Totally the not, did not happen, it was much harder to make. But we wanted a better machine, so, so at the time we took a pre-order for the Rask and we wanted to make a lot of them. So that's, that's kind of the push to get the bigger shop and the bigger machine and you know, start taking this business very seriously and start dumping some significant money into it. Um, but yeah, so for the past five years, the knife, I mean, the, the Mori has been making, it made 327 rasks before we uh, put the rask on the shelf for a little while. And then it's made 4,600, well, more than 4,000 Norsemen. So we made the first 500 Norsemen, almost exactly, um, on the old Tormac mill. And then everything after, roughly after number 500, has been made on the Mori. And there was a little bit of a transition point, I remember, when I'd make, I was still making the blades on the Tormac and the handles moved to the Mori, and then we kind of switched around a little bit. But yeah, roughly around number 500, everything after that has been on the Mori. And every single Rask, except for the very first prototype um, that Barry has right now, was made on the Mori as well. Um, but yeah, so in total we've made, I mean, 4,500 knives or so, 
on the mill in the past five years, uh, some pretty decent gross revenues. Um, obviously, there's a lot of expenses and everything. But uh, yeah, I'll get into the pricing. In um, if you're thinking about buying a new machine, obviously you need to figure out what your uh, requirements are, what your needs are, size, power, ratio. Think about what you're actually gonna be using it for. I fully admit we overbought like crazy. This is way more than we need right now. But the opportunity came up, they gave us a really good price on it, and I feel very confident in the choice that we made. Um, it's amazing, I love it. <laughs> it's fantastic. I financed anything before. Um, it was daunting and scary. I mean, this has a very large price tag. It was $144,000 US, all in with the chip conveyor and the tooling package and everything we needed and the transformer and delivery and everything terrifying okay <laughs> yeah it was it, it's it's huge like we've never kind of signed up for that kind of commitment before right um, it's a five-year lease yeah I'm not a big commitment guy <laughs> um, so yeah it, it's tough like you know I've, I've had a couple car loans and that's terrifying right but for a five ten thousand dollar car exactly but a mortgage is <laughs> a little bit more yeah so I've got the uh, original order contract here, the invoice. It's kind of fun to look through it and see, see what everything cost. Um, so in the end, total price for this machine before tax, not including any tax, was $131,925.07 US dollars. Uh, so 130 grand. And that's an insane amount of money, especially five years ago when we had almost no money and the Tormax were all paid off, so we had we didn't have $130,000. So through DMG Mori, they hooked us up with the bank, one of the banks that they tend to use a lot. I think it was Travelers um, here in Canada. And, uh, you know, they kind of greased the wheels and they kind of said, yeah, these guys are good. Like, you know, do their financials and, and check through them and everything. Um, but we were able to get the loan um, for this machine and we had to put 10% down. So that's, you know, $13,000 had to come down which is fairly typical for a machine. Um, and then, yeah, it's just big numbers, big, big money at the time. Um, so yeah, going through, so it's a Cat 40 machine, which is the tool holder. And let me show you guys one right here. Uh, where does Angelo keep them? I guess they're here. So this is a Cat 40 tool holder, very standard, very classic. Um, most machines, I'd say, use CAD 40. It's just one of the most common. And then this machine is also a big plus spindle, where CAD 40 you know, closes on the taper, but there's usually a little gap there. But if you notice how this holder has a thicker flangey thingy, that's where the big plus comes into place because the holder not only secures on the taper, but it goes all the way to the flange and it actually like seats, so it's got two points of contact, which makes the tool much more rigid in the cut. And uh, it's a good selling feature, especially for a machine that's gonna hog a lot of metal. Not that we hog a lot of metal, cause we don't, but uh, it makes for a better spindle. So this, I mean, I didn't choose it, it just happened to come on this machine and it's been great. And some of my tool holders have big plus and some do not. And uh, they say that you're not supposed to switch back and forth you know, you have, have both tools in the machine, either go all the big plus or not. I don't care. I've done both. Um, theory being this machine, this tool holder will always have a gap here of about an eighth of an inch. Chips and garbage will get in there. And then you have a big plus that comes in and squishes them down. Um, that's not the greatest, you know, thought in the world, but uh, it, it's worked. I've never had a problem with it. High speed spindle, 12,000 RPM. This thing has an amazingly beautiful spindle on it. First of all, take, take a look at how big that is. That's like, I don't even know how many inches that is, but that's very big. You look at a Haas spindle and it's like this big. Uh, it is a monster bearing. The, the bigger your bearings are, the more torsional rigidity it has, um, the awesomer it is. And also you can go like this and it just keeps spinning for a little while. The bearings are so smooth and it just helps. It sounds awesome. 
cuts awesome, leaves an amazing surface finish. Uh, it's a very, very, very good machine. So the high-speed spindle option is the $3,400 upgrade, although the machine came with it, so it wasn't a choice. Tool storage capacity, 30 tools, which is apparently a $680 upgrade. I don't know what the other option is, but I'll show you on the side here. If you look that way, you can see the tool rack with the 30 pots. This is a side mount tool changer. Um, it has been full of 30. Every pallet that we run now uses 30 tools. Use this every single one, every night, nonstop. Um, and it's great, and except for that gross rust in the middle that's happened in the past few years just due to humidity and running the machine so much more. That's, that's like the only gross part of the whole machine. So I don't know what's going on there, but um, yeah. Depending on what you're doing, like I, I wish I had a few more tools because you always want a little bit more than you have if you're hitting that limit. Um, but we've, we've done quite well with 30 and I, I really, really like the 30. I'm always trying to put so much work onto it at one time. So I want more tools and more tools and more tools. If you separate, like if we only did handles, I wouldn't need 30 tools. But now that we're doing handles and blades and clips and engraving and all kinds of stuff, I just, I always want that extra little one. Okay. Through spindle coolant system is a $3,200 upgrade. Um, the machine came with that, kind of. It, so through spindle coolant is where coolant normally comes out these nozzles and sprays at the tool from the outside, which is fine. Through spindle has coolant that goes through the middle of the tool holder and either out the collet or ideally out little holes in the drill bit or in the end mill straight to where your cutting zone is. And for drill bits, that's fantastic. Um, actually, I've got some right on my table in the current here. So this is a through coolant drill bit. Notice the two little holes. And then imagine coolant going through that little tube at monstrous pressures. I think the current has a thousand PSI, which is a lot. But then coolant goes exactly to where the cutting flutes are. There's no better solution. And for a drill, then the chips and the coolant and everything comes out the hole. You're not just like giving it a bath from the outside when actually the, the drill is in your hole like hot and bothered and, and stuck. Um, so through spindle is an awesome idea and it's great. And we use it on a lot of the other machines too. The machine came prepped for through spindle coolant. What that means is at the top of the spindle, there's a rotary union or a uh, Dublin or a bunch of different names for it. Basically a rotating, um, it's a way to have a seal so cooling can come in and it still spins like freely. It's like little um, ceramic discs that seal very good. And that's one of the bigger expenses of, and, and annoyances to install. The machine came with that, but it did not come with a pump for the high pressure coolant. And I never put one in. So we have high pressure coolant capability, but we do not have high pressure coolant. Um, it's most useful for things like that for drill bits, but I, it's one of those things I think if I had it, if I had had it for the past five years, I would have used it a lot. So for all you guys thinking about buying machines, um, weigh the balance, weigh the benefits. It might be something that you want, it might not, because it's usually many thousands of dollars to upgrade on any machine. Um, it's, it's one of those things, you can save some money, or if you just want to get all the bells and whistles, then if you get it, use it. Next up on our um, invoice here, ch chip conveyor. Uh, chip conveyor is somewhere where you can save money, but I'm so glad that I got this because it's one of those things, adding something and paying cash for it as opposed to putting it into the financing, um, it's annoying and sometimes you just never get to it. So I'm really glad we got the chip conveyor for this. So the way this machine works, um, machining happens here. Let me move the table out of the way so that you can... Uh... Why aren't you moving? There you go. So let's talk about the chip augers and everything. If you look in here, Fraser, so you can see the chip augers, those things spin super slowly. You can see my shadow of my finger. Um, all the chips, machining happens, machining happens, coolant goes down, chips go down, chips end up there, they get augered forward, and this is your chip filter, your um, chip conveyor. 
And I think, you stay there. I think I can do this manually, yeah. So with the door open, you have limited uh, functionality, but I can hold the button and you can see it's working. The coolant, the chips come forward, um, conveyor's moving. Works great. Never clogs up, never, uh, never really had a problem with it. I know chip, chip evacuation is kind of a problem with every machine. Every machine's got its weird little, like, oh, I, you know, chips are packing up in the corner or the chute is clogging or um, on this machine, it's these. It's these front trays. Now, if you don't have a chip conveyor, this is how you're supposed to empty the, tr the chips. These trays come up and forward, and you can see how much stuff, even with the chip conveyor, this is what's leaking pat out the sides of the chip conveyor, or it's falling through all those little holes, or it's, uh, it's just kind of bypassing the mesh that's on there, still. So we empty these weekly or better, um, otherwise they will clog up and they will cause problems, and then all these chips go into your um, the chip conveyor basin is actually your coolant tank, which is kind of cool. Like this is, you know, whatever, six inches tall of, of coolant. But I don't want these chips to end up in that coolant. Um, so yeah, we empty these out. This is annoying. It's fine, but you can see the, the gap there in the machine, kind of where the stuff comes out. <laughs> the funny thing with these is that there's another sheath metal guard here, just like this guy, that covers all of this up. And for the first two years of having this machine, I never took it off. I didn't know these were here. I didn't know these filled up. I didn't know this, <laughs> these had to be managed. Um, so once I realized that, then we just took it off and like left it off. And I like being able to see this so that, I, uh, so that we know to, to change them out and I just dripped coolant all over the floor, so I'm gonna clean this up. Yeah. So like I said, the, cool, the chip conveyor is the coolant tank. It goes there, it goes about probably this far into the machine, it goes this way. Chips come up, and then into the bin here. Take a look at that. Plus some extra rask handles. <laughs> Um, it's great. We use these Rubbermaid um, Home Depot tubs. Three high stacks exactly perfectly with the height of this. Um, we have it on a piece of cardboard so that we can slide it in and out easily without screwing up the floors. And uh, it works great. Works really, really well. Fun fact about this e-stop button. We used to have a toolbox at the old shop especially. The toolbox would be right here. You'd never see that e-stop button. Every now and then, for whatever reason, it got hit. And then the machine is, is alarmed out for like, and then for hours, we're like, what's wrong? I don't know. I, everything's off. I can't figure out why it's stuck. And then eventually we're like, oh, because somebody bumped that e-stop. Um, I mean, it's great because if your hand is stuck in there and you, you can stop it from there, it's, it's a seriously dangerous item. But so you need a safety valve there. I love it but it's funny when it gets hit and you don't realize. So a lot of our tools are teeny tiny like this. This is a Lakeshore Carbide uh, tapered engraving ball mill, and this is also Lakeshore, but it's a 93 thou four flute end mill. So a lot of our tools are teeny tiny. I like having the 12,000 RPM on this machine. I run probably more than half of our tools at 12,000 all the time. Um, a lot of machines you buy might come with a 6,000 RPM spindle, or the Tormac had a 50, 200 or something like that, um, which is fine. But the fact that I can run a lot at 12,000 is amazing, especially the smaller tools. So I'm, I'm glad I went with the 12,000 option. I think I would have been crippled with a 6,000 RPM spindle. Uh, especially if you're cutting things like aluminum, you want rip-ems, you want the RPMs. Um, titanium and stainless, you get to run a lot slower. Like I'm running a quarter inch end mill at I think 5,000 RPM, but you get your speeds and feeds to be where you want them to be. Um, the current, however, has 42,000 RPM, and, and I use that as much as I can, too. So that's cool. For the most part, in the five and a half years, the only major thing that's gone wrong with the machine is the door interlock switch broke. And it was like a $400 part. We overnighted from Texas, 
took a couple days. Um, but what that is, is when you close the door, see this little, uh, this little flapper right there? That goes into here and it locks it. So if I close the door now, the door is closed. I cannot open the door without telling the machine, okay, please open the door for me. And now I can open it. Um, and for whatever reason, the latchy thingy on that side just broke. It just stopped working, it froze up, whatever. And uh, you can cheat and illegally remove this and like do it manually, but it doesn't work for the first startup in the morning. For the, um, I forget what it was, this was two or three years ago, but there was a reason why that didn't work to hack the switch to work, because the switch was broken. So the machine was actually down for two or three days, which, which sucked at the time, but um, that's really the only da downtime that we've had due to a malfunction, which I'm calling that a win in five and a half years. That's fantastic. Never had a spindle problem, and this spindle being so big and so burly, I have bumped this thing so many times. I have shifted the vices like inches over by making a bad mistake. Um, it is very rigid, very strong, super awesome machine beefy um, yeah so once we got the interlock fixed then smooth sailing again so after running it for a couple of years in the first few years we noticed that uh, the the coolant ports were getting clogged up with little chips and fines and stuff and the fact that we do such fine detail machining and very light cuts and finishing cuts and things like that we're making these micro micro machine micro machine um, uh, chips so we installed this coolant filter. Um, in fact, I love this filter so much, we have the same thing on the Nakamura, and if you look over there, I just installed two of them on the Kern. Uh, they're fantastic. They're from McMaster Car. They're roughly $500. Just look up coolant filter, bag filter or something. You'll find this, it's about $550. The bags are $10 each. Um, we attach pressure, pressure gauges so that we have an inlet and an outlet pressure. Theoretically being that if the bag is super clogged, your inlet pressure will be high and your outlet pressure will be low. So this lets us see that. And I need to 3D print a little mount so I can see them right there. I did print one for the current, it turned out awesome. This bag filter, it just uses like a sock, like a big old tube sock. And you can get it in, you know, three micron, five micron, 10. I think we've got 10 micron in this machine right now. Um, there really should be a note telling me that, but there isn't. Um, but yeah, the, having cool infiltration, it just, it makes sure all this stuff coming out the nozzle is clean because you don't want to shoot chips at the cutting flutes. Carbide is very hard and very brittle. And if you're putting heated stainless steel chips or titanium or, you know, um, abrasive stuff, you're shooting it right at the tool, your tool life is gonna be garbage, or you're spraying it into a hole, you're now spraying ch more chips into a hole that you're machining, and you just, it's not a good idea. So this is a very good investment, and uh, for the relatively cheap, um, you know, five, six, seven hundred dollars with all the fittings and everything, um, it's so worth it, so, so, so worth it. On top of that, we installed this guy. This is the Next Gen Coolant Coalescer. If you look up the word coalescer, um, you'll start seeing stuff like this. And what this does is it's got a little pump in the tank right here. This is a float valve that it get a shot straight down the top. So what this does is it sucks the top layer of oil into the little funnel venturi thing in the middle. And then oil floats on water. So the oil will go into there, it'll suck down into the pipe, it'll go into here, it'll go down, and then through all the baffles, and then oil will come up, and your, your gross, garbagey oil, your foam, your uh, other stuff will float on top so that you can drain it with these little valves into our garbage bucket. And then clean coolant comes out here and goes back in the machine. So if you look on this side, look how gross that is, because we're not filtering this side of the tank. We should be, but at the moment, we're not. See, there's floating chips, there's oil, there's whatever. Um, less than ideal, but look how clean this side of the tank is, because this thing works. So what we should probably do for this machine is T the, actually we might need two pumps if we're gonna do that. But if we had suction from both sides, um, 
into the thing, then we'd be filtering both sides of the coolant. And maybe we'll do that one day. Also having an external sight gauge on your coolant tank is fantastic. Because then every time you walk by the machine, you can just glance at it. You can be like, yeah, it's half full. Okay, we're good. Um, and you get to learn the machine. You get to know like, okay, if it's down to here, it's not going to last the night or something like that. I don't think there's a low coolant alarm on this machine because I've seen the, the coolant coming out the nozzles will start to get really, really weak. And that tells me I'm out of coolant, um, sometimes too late. So the high pressure coolant that I was talking about before is literally this right there. If I put a pump on this and put, you know, 300 PSI or more, um, I would have through pressure coolant, through spindle coolant. But I haven't yet because sometimes I'm cheap and I don't want to buy that pump. And it's like, do I need it that bad? Kind of. Do I want it that bad? I don't know. So I just haven't done it yet. So the next thing that always blows my mind whenever I see a uh, machine quote, $990 for a um, signal tower three layer light, red, yellow, green, LED light. That's this guy right up here. A thousand bucks to tell you if the machine's running or not running. It sounds ridiculous. I freaking love it. It's too much money, but I still love it. Um, let me run a quick dummy cycle for you. I'll show you a hack on this machine too that uh, Rob Lockwood, my buddy, told me. If you want to run a program and not run the coolant, so you have, I can do, okay, the coolant's on right now, I can do it off. If you hold the off button for two or three seconds, now the coolant is locked off. So I can run a cycle without the coolant. Um, I didn't know that. It might be in the manual, I'm not sure, but Rob had to tell me. So if light is off right now, if I run a quick uh, fake little cycle here, changing a tool, yeah, so green. Green means it's on. Um, that works good. When there's an alarm, it'll, um, it'll flash yellow or orange, I'm not sure. And then it'll beep like really, really annoyingly. Um, and then red means uh, it's done with the cycle, it's good. So it, it's handy because we can walk around the shop and be like, green, good. Green means go. Um, so with the signal light on the surface grinder, if you look way through there, we did buy the, uh, th the signal light and I think it was seven or eight hundred dollars. And I remember cringing when I saw that quote and I was like, do I want it? I do want it, don't I? It's stupid money. It's not worth that much money for three LEDs, but I still want it. And I don't want to, I don't want to make my own solution. I just want it. I want it done. And it's great because we can see that like we're here at the Mori. So Angelo is running the Mori and he can look over and he'd be like, okay, the surface grinder is still running. Um, so it's good. It's already been beneficial. And we have it on the Tornos. We do not have one on the Nakamura. It's fine. You can usually hear when that, that thing's machine is running. Uh, the current has them, although it's off right now and it's got green, so I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> I'm sure you can reprogram it. But yeah, signal lights, mostly good. Next, we'll talk about the probes. Um, so the spindle probe, this is the Renishaw OMP60. Fantastic device. I've got the little um, two millimeter ball, I think it is. So what this does, it's a measuring device. So it senses whenever it gets sideways motion in any direction or vertical motion um, when you're touching the surface of the part. So you can get into a hole and you can go touch, 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 and you can measure the surface and super accurately locate where you are in the machine coordinates. Fantastic. In my opinion, every mill needs one of those with rare exceptions. Um, some guys don't use them and that's fine, but you're just living a difficult life. This makes life awesome. Very expensive though. On the quote here, I don't know, these numbers are just stupid. $11,500 for that installed with training. Um, and then the table sensor was $7,500. So that's this guy over there. So what that does is it takes your tool and the tool, the end mill or drill or whatever will touch down on top of it. Um, it can also measure diameter and it can measure breakage detection mid-cycle and we use that thing all the time. 
Uh, most tools, especially the delicate ones, get brake detected after every cycle. So after the tool is done, it'll go eh, over there, touch, broken or not broken, and then keep going if it's good or alarm out and stop if it's broken. And unfortunately, one of the cringiest things is walking in, in the morning and hearing the machine complaining after a night run because there's a broken tool. And even worse than a broken tool is a broken tool very early in the machining process. So that what should have been an eight hour cycle broke after 30 minutes. And like usually five minutes after you leave the door. That sucks. Um, but the probes are great. So these two put together almost $20,000 of, of list price, whatever that number is. Um, when you buy a Haas machine, I don't know how they do it, but what I paid 20,000 US for, you can get on a Haas for like 6,000 for relatively the same exact things. I don't know if they have some like handshake deal where they're cheaper or something, but, uh, or bulk quantity or something like that. But uh, you guys getting Haas machines get, are lucky paying the cheap, cheap prices for those probes. So get them, don't not get them, get them, trust me. Inventory clearance discount. Now this is where sometimes it's not a bad idea to pressure your, your sales reps. Um, not that I knew how to do that back five, six years ago, buying my first big machine. I'm like this little, you know, scared little kid. <laughs> um, but according to this invoice, $48,000, dollars $48, um, inventory clearance discount because this was a floor model, had some hours on it, and that's probably some of the sale price and that's like, every deal is, is rolled into that pricing. Um, but that's like almost 50 grand off the retail price. Uh, that's cool. Even still, the machine was $131,000. And then also I got a Sandvik tooling certificate. So when you buy a brand new machine, you can often, if somebody tells you about this, you can go to the big companies like Sandvik or whoever else. I mean, Sandvik just sells everything, so it's a good place to start. And you can usually get up to 40% off of everything you buy if you tie it to a machine purchase. You say, I just bought a DMG Mori, where's my Sandvik discount? Um, which is good, because they want you to tool up with all one brand of tools. So some vendors do that and some don't. Uh, we did, and we got $6,000 of Sandvik tools uh, minus the 40%. And it's great, we got, most of our tool holders are Sandvik. The Sandvik pull studs, Sandvik uh, nuts, and Sandvik collets. I did not like the Sandvik bearing nuts at all. I've replaced all of them, they're garbage. I'm sorry. Um, so I'm using a lot of Mary Tool stuff now. And uh, Mary Tool stuff's great. Good morning everyone, John Grimsmo here in the new Grimsmo Knives Workshop. Um, we're expecting a fairly large delivery today and I just wanted to show you guys how incredibly raining it is outside. So it's really hard to like get stuff done and be productive when you're waiting for something big and enormous to come in, but it's still exciting. We got the electricians here now putting in more plugs for us. And uh, yeah, thank you. Slicing it open with a Grimsmo Norseman. I actually make contact with the plastic. John and Eric here. Uh, it is August 26th, my birthday, 32 Yay. years old, and uh, best birthday in the world because my new toy is getting installed today. Getting uh, plugged in and cleaned up. So the funny thing is, buying a new machine, you don't know everything, you don't know what's going on, you don't know what to expect. Your salesman doesn't always tell you what to expect. So we pay all this money to get this machine and it was already late and delayed and I was reading through my old emails to the guy and I was kind of mad because I'm like, we are so broke right now, I need that machine so I can make money because you're already late. And so I get, get the machine delivered into the, into the 
our old shop at then then it was our new shop and then like a week or two later i get this other bill for twenty three hundred dollars for the delivery of the machine and i was like i just paid 130 grand for this machine why am i paying another twenty three hundred dollars oh that's delivery that's rigging that's a separate company that you have to pay for that and now i'm used to it now it makes sense but at the time i was very shocked by that cash outlay 2300 bucks i was not expecting to spend um, to get that machine delivered and yeah, it's just not fun so try to wrap your head around the whole picture as you're doing this to know what to expect and not be freaked out by stuff like that okay so the other thing when you buy a new machine is it has to be plugged into the wall these are not uh, little 110 plugs or a tormac which will plug into a dryer plug this is 400 volts this machine runs off our shop voltage is 600 because we're in canada uh, so you need a transformer which is another thousand dollars you have to buy plus you have to pay the electrician money a thousand dollars or whatever you know whatever it costs um, to install that so it's just money 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 getting this stuff installed but the beautiful thing about these machines is they make money that's their whole purpose in life is to make you money so allow them to make you money um, but yeah the transformer in, in the old shop, we had them on the ground and you'd trip over them. There's cables everywhere. Here, we mounted everything up on the walls with unistruts going across. Now we can walk clear paths behind the machines. It's really nice to have like this much room behind the machines so that you can just, you know, have room. So that guy up there is a Mistfit. Awesome Canadian company. They're only a couple hours away. Um, it's a mist collector. So when you're machining, especially at 12,000 RPM, and certain tools, the coolant is splashing on it, it creates a mist. It's just, it's like a fog in there, like a jungle dense, kind of, you can't even see through it, a mist. Not super good for your lungs, not good in an enclosed space, like our old shop was kind of small. Um, sunbeam comes in through the window and you can see just how much mist is in the air. So having a filtered mist extraction unit is wonderful. We have to add this separate, and it was several thousand dollars. Um, now we have them on all the machines, uh, but it quality of life goes up. And actually, we saw some benefits in machining and in coolant life by getting that mist out of there. And uh, what it does is it extracts it out. And because the coolant is a uh, oil water mix, that kind of separates the the air from the coolant, and then the the coolant will congeal on the bottom of the little panels, will drip back down and remix again. Um, so you're not, you're really only expurging, expurging uh, water, mist, like, um, what do you call it? I don't know, gas out the top. So no coolant escapes. And the filters on those are super duper 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 good. And yeah, I, I noticed that the old shop in the smaller space, air quality went up significantly. So this magical little button right there, APF, auto power function. This will shut off the machine when it successfully completes a cycle, when it hits an M30. Um, so we hit this, you know, at the end of this video, I'll, I'll run this for the night because everybody else has gone home. Um, we have a over 10 hour run planned for tonight. Um, so I'm going to hit the little APF and uh, once the machine, if the machine gets to the end, if it doesn't have a broken tool or something, then it'll read the M30 and then it'll turn the lights off and then you hear the whole machine just and it literally disconnects the main power switch in the back. So in the morning when you come in, you have to, you have to flip the breaker pretty much on the machine to turn it back on again. Fantastic function, means you're not spewing air and electricity and lights and power uh, when you don't need the machine. So I like how this machine has it. A lot of the, our other machines don't and I really wish they did. It's a great function. Fixturing is a topic I'm very passionate about and uh, I could literally talk for an hour So I'm just gonna gloss over this where we're at right now is we have these orange vices love the orange vices um, And we have aluminum fixtures on top. So if you loosen the main center screw here This whole aluminum piece comes off. I'm sure we have another one over here somewhere. I mean, it's basically this these are these are old rask pallet from four years ago um, basically this whole thing comes off it's relatively quick change it's relatively good repeatability um, but the point i want to make to you guys when you're specking out a machine when you're figuring out how to tool it up and stuff is you might hear buzzwords called zero point work holding and all that really means is 
when you take something off and put it back on, it goes on in the exact same spot every time, no matter what, in X, Y, and Z. And you 1 million percent want that. You need that. Um, if you're constantly tramming parts in or putting, putting thing in a vise and you know, moving it to the side so that it's always close, um, it's not good enough. And as your budget allows and as your requirements allow for pr production and productivity is how much more money you can spend on, um, on good, 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 good fixturing. You don't have to you know, spend all your money up front on like super laying pallets and 12 grand worth of vices and stuff like that, but work your way into it. So put a lot of thought into how you're gonna fixture whatever it is you're going to be making. And you can totally start cheap and upgrade from there if you don't need it, but basically with more money comes more accuracy and speed of repeatability, of putting parts on and off. And we've gone through many different uh, variations and I, I still have more iterations that I want to put on in the next few months. But we've, we've had it like this for four years now with these full top plates um, where we can do the inside of two handles, or like a pa or two pairs, two knives, the top side of two knives and the soft blades of two knives and the clips of two knives and the blades go on the side of the fixture for two knives. So every single pallet, this makes two Norsemen right here. This makes two more, that makes two more. We're gonna run all of this tonight and we're gonna come back in the morning and there's gonna be six knives fully machined, um, which allows us to maximize our nighttime run. And I'm totally fine with the machine sitting idle like while we're doing this video. Um, because we're planning, we're banking on the night run to be successful. And we've been doing night runs for four years, every night, literally five nights a week. Uh, the APF works because then that Friday night, the machine's not just like saying, I'm done all weekend. It's, it turns off. Um, often enough, you come back to a broken tool and you have to fix that, but that helps you learn your process reliability. And that's what this is all about. I want my tools to last for a very known amount of time so that I can replace them early and know that they're not gonna break on me. And we keep data, we track our tool life. We know that after six pallets, this tool has to be replaced because it only lasts for eight or whatever. Um, so every tool gets tracked like that. And we've got a video about tracking tool life macros, I'm pretty sure. Um, so put a lot of thought into your fixed string. I mean, maybe I'm just obsessive about that, I really am. but. This, this system works well. It can work a lot better, but it works very well for us right now. And uh, we do have room for another fourth vise right there. Um, but yeah, you want parts to load easily and repeatably and the same every time. So, I mean, it was to the point where um, when my father-in-law Barry started working for us four years ago, uh, he was loading the pallets every morning and he would add parts and he'd put it on the machine and he was even pushing a few buttons and getting it going and that helped me teach other people how to run my baby my machine and now now our guy steven is loading the pallets in the morning and angelo is running this machine 90 percent of the time i basically never touch this machine anymore um, i've touched it more and talked about it more in the past hour with you guys than i have in the past a long time uh, and I'm totally fine with that. But it's awesome to be able to teach that knowledge into other people and to give them some rope and to make the system easy enough that other people can like handle it and just run it and uh, execute on your plan. And that's how you grow a business. Otherwise, you're always stuck behind a machine. And uh, the only machine I'm currently stuck behind is the Kern, which I'm very happy about. But you know, every other machine ha now has uh, staff that are getting very, very good at running that machine. And that's excellent. So when you're thinking about making a gigantic investment like this, um, do your homework. Because you start looking at all the spec sheets and all the options and all the add-ons and you kind of want everything. There's a couple of things you're like, I don't need that, not even interested. But you know, you want the high pressure coolant, you want the chip conveyor, you want the extra look ahead, you want, uh, you want all the cool stuff. But, Depending on your budget, I know like everybody's got to watch their money. Um, you can't get it all. And I definitely have bought options for various machines that I've never used or parts that are sitting on the shelf that were exciting at the time to buy, but never got installed or never were needed or thousands of dollars of stuff that was like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. 
but I thought I needed it. So kind of a regret thing, but I don't live life with regrets. I just move on. But um, I try to use that knowledge on the next purchase and the next purchase and try to figure out, you know, just, just be careful, do your homework. I don't want to see you guys spend money that you don't need to spend. Um, but I do want to see you put money into very valuable things that are going to like, the purpose of this machine is to make me money, to make the company money. And this machine has been a win. I'm super, five and a half years later, it was the right decision for us. It's, it's an absolute beast. It's a workhorse. Like I said, I've crashed it badly in ways that would probably break other machines. Uh, and it just goes, oops, doesn't care. <laughs> not, I'm not suggesting that, but I'm saying it was a very good purchase for us. And I'm, now that I own it, it is literally paid off. We have the paperwork back from the bank that say, this is yours now. Uh, that feels really good in my, in my heart. Um, and this is the kind of machine that, assuming we still need it for the forever future, like we could have this forever. We could run it into the ground. This is ours now. I don't owe anybody, this is mine. So that's fantastic. Um, yeah, so uh, now that uh, Fraser and I are the last people here, because it's late, um, it is my job every now and then, um, what am I trying to say? Sometimes I will run the night run, but the guys have already set it all up for me. For the most part, it's already running by like four o'clock, but uh, I'm gonna run this pallet. So I'm just gonna, I wanna make sure that I focus because when you're machining, you don't wanna forget stuff. So it's hard to narrate and machine at the same time. But I'm gonna go to memory. I'm gonna, this is a spindle warm up program. So I'm just gonna kind of word vomit while I'm doing this. Go over to my Master Norseman four pallet program. APF is on. Now I'm assuming that Angelo has already run the tool life uh, macro. It's a program we run that goes, that reads all of the tool life and compares it to known values and says, okay, you got to replace tool seven, tool nine, and tool 12. Otherwise the machine will not last the pallet, um, the, the night run. I'm 99.10% positive that he's already done that because he said it's good to go. Uh, I just haven't done it and he hasn't said that to me, but it's good to go. So if I just run that cycle start, always keep my hand on the feed rate override knob just so I can like slow it down. So I built this kind of master program that will go in and will probe every single pallet. Probe it in Z and now it's going to probe it in X and then it's going to probe it in Y and then it's going to probe the top of the handles and it's going to do that for all three handles, all three pallets. And it stores all that data um, in macro variables. And I've become very uh, like reading the matrix on mac macro variables. And they're super powerful. Yeah, so it's going to do that for a few minutes. And then it's going to drill the detent hole where the ceramic detent ball goes in. So the way we have it set up is we have, um, it runs for about five minutes where it probes, does all the probing, does the drilling chamfering the holes and then pauses and waits for you. And then you got to go in, you got to blow out the holes and you got to put in the little ceramic detent balls. Ta -da. So I literally just stick my finger in there and I grab, what are we going to need? Six, two, four, six. So I grab six of these guys. And then I manually plop them in. And I do have some automated ideas for making this awesome, but I'm just not quite there yet. So that's it for this video, guys. Um, yeah, this thing's gonna run again all night, almost all night, and it's fantastic. It's so satisfying coming in in the morning and being like, you know what? This thing made six knives overnight. I wasn't even here. That's awesome. Utilizing that nighttime is like the greatest thing we've ever done because it's one thing to be here and to hustle and to make like one part at a time and um, it's just not efficient. It's just busy. I'd rather fiddle with the machine in the day. I'd rather replace a bunch of tools and like tram in the vices and make a little thing. And then, you know, the day can be more relaxed on this machine and the nighttime can just run. And we've developed this process over the past four years of our goal is to run it at night. 
So we will do whatever it takes to make sure the tools last and, and all that stuff. So when you have that mindset, you just kind of make it happen. So yeah, all right guys, take care, bye bye.